I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con content, not even one tweet. And yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed... You just lied. What, no, no, what I claimed was... Uh, hey everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Lights. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people practical psychology and behavioral analysis on stages and television shows all over the world. This week we're looking at a very special interview that has been going viral all over the internet where BBC reporter James Clayton interviewed multi-billionaire entrepreneur Elon Musk. Or was it the way around? Was it Elon Musk interviewing James? It's not quite clear in certain places. Whatever the case, there is some fascinating stuff happening here with the body language, the facial expressions, the word choice, and a power dynamic that's really interesting to see here, shifting back and forth. So let's just dive right in and see what the behaviors of these two gentlemen could tell us about what they're thinking and how they're feeling, starting with this. Why did you agree to do this, this interview with the BBC? Um, I don't know, I like spontaneity. I actually um, do have a lot of respect for the BBC. Um, Although sometimes I forget what the BBC stands for, you know, but uh, what is it? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you know um, what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. There is a lot going on right in the beginning. So this is the beginning of the interview and it's a good opportunity for us to just sense comfort right off the top and to look at both players and see how comfortable each one is feeling. So one of the things that I teach in my workshops about the comfort of someone who's sitting down, and this is a, just a really great tip overall to keep in mind anytime you're observing someone who's sitting down is this. To know how comfortable someone is when they're sitting, try to estimate how long it would take for them to get up and leave with all their belongings. So if we think about someone who's really comfortable, they're sitting down, they're really sinking into their chair, usually pretty spread out, sitting in the back of the chair, their legs might be extended, their belongings might be, you know, a bag here, a jacket there, a hat there. They're comfortable, they're taking up space, they're not really worried about getting out of there. Whereas someone who's more stressed or uncomfortable or insecure, doesn't really want to be there, Typically, we're gonna see a little more like sitting up straight or even forward. We might see their legs on the floor, both of them, you know, so they won't be crossed or comfortable. They'll be flat on the floor. We might sometimes see the hands on the knees or on the thighs, you know, ready to get up. And their belongings might be all very close to them. You know, they don't take off their jacket, they hold onto their bag because they're ready to get up and leave. The reason I find this really reliable is because our limbic system is always thinking about one thing and that thing is survival. So whenever we're in a situation where we're feeling stressed or threatened, it doesn't quite allow us to relax in case we need to react, in case we need to get out of there, distance ourselves from that stress. So right off the bat, as we look at these two gentlemen, we're seeing two individuals who can get up and leave rather quickly. Now for one of these people, that's gonna change. For one of these people, that's never gonna go away for this entire interview. So if we look at Elon Musk specifically right here, as it begins, he's got his phone in his hands. So, you know, he's holding on to his personal belonging. He's got one hand on his knee. So this is a position that'll make it very easy for him to just get up. One of his legs is on the ground a little further back. It's in a good position to get up. The other one's a little more relaxed, a little more forward, which that one suggests a little more relaxation. Now, as this interview goes on, he's gonna relax a little bit more. We're gonna see those hands come to life a little bit more. The posture is gonna relax a little bit more. If we look at the interviewer, on the other hand, he's got both of his feet backwards, which, first of all, signals subconscious distancing. He's, as much as he can, within the constraints of that chair, trying to put distance between him and Elon Musk, but also that's an optimal position for him to stand up. Both his feet are grounded. His hand is on his knee, and it's gonna spend a lot of time there during this interview. And then he's got his phone in his other hand, and he keeps looking down at his phone. In fact, pay attention to how often he looks at his phone shortly after he's asked Elon Musk a question. So he asks a question, as Elon starts to answer, all of a sudden he looks down at his phone. I personally find this dismissive and unprofessional. I think it would be a lot better if he had a teleprompter or someone holding up questions or just something where it didn't look dismissive where he's like, mm-hmm, 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 and he's just kind of looking at his phone. How much attention can you be paying in a conversation when you're constantly looking at your phone trying to figure out what you're supposed to be asking next? You're also signaling that what you're saying isn't important because I'm thinking about what's coming up. And this is happening constantly with this guy. Elon will put his phone away at the two minute mark and spend most of this interview without his phone in his hand. 
whereas James will have that phone in his hand for the rest of this interview. Now I'm also going to play devil's advocate just a little bit on this one. Um, the chairs don't help. Look at those chairs. That, like I'm uncomfortable just looking at those chairs. I don't know the room they're in, but if I look in the background, I don't know why they didn't just kind of approach that furniture and do the interview in a kind of more relaxed, comfortable environment. Potentially, you know, put a table where they could put their phones down if James needs to look over at his phone. These two chairs where there's really nothing around to put his phone on is creating a very uncomfortable situation, I feel. Neither of them looks comfortable. Now, at the end of that clip, Elon Musk does something and there's a response to it by James Clayton that I believe sets the tone for this entire interview. Now, before we talk about what that is, please keep in mind that Elon Musk has been very open to the world with the fact that he has a syndrome that used to be referred to as Asperger's syndrome. In 2015, the DSM decided to no longer have Asperger's be a separate thing and they've combined it with the autism spectrum disorder. So technically in current lingo, uh, Elon Musk has very high functioning autism. Now later in this video, we're gonna talk about the autism spectrum and how it affects behavioral analysis. Cause it's a question that I get asked very often in the comments and I'm really excited to dive into that. But the reason I bring it up now, it, well, it's twofold. First of all, very often, you know, we say when we see stress, when we see clusters of stress, it might be tied to deception and it very well might, but the first time that Elon Musk publicly revealed that he has Asperger's syndrome, he also jokingly revealed that he has a difficult time with eye contact. I'm actually making history tonight as the first person with Asperger's to host SNL. So we'll make a lot of eye contact with the cast tonight. Now, although that is something that's quite common for individuals on the autism spectrum, it's also something to keep in mind here because he's sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone, talking to this person, so that obligation to make eye contact might be stressing him out a little bit. Important to keep that in mind. But the second reason I wanted to bring that up right now is at the end of this, he does something that I don't think is natural for him. I think it's throughout life, he realized that when he does this, people tend to relax and it helps conversations move along. He's going to make a joke and James Clayton doesn't catch on to this. So what he says is, as he's talking about BBC, although I forget what BBC stands for sometimes. And if you look at his delivery, he's breaking eye contact and he's kind of just spitting out the words and then he laughs and he laughs in a very particular way. His shoulders come up and he has this loud laugh. Now, this isn't the first time that we're going to see this in this interview. He does this numerous times. I mean, have I shot myself in the foot with tweets multiple times? Yes. Do, do you feel like... <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the reason. And almost every time he does it, he's kind of laughing at a situation that he experienced or something that he did. And it's that same laugh. Shoulders up, big laugh. Now, again, I believe this is something that he's noted, whether someone told him or whether he read it somewhere or whether he noticed it himself, it's almost like he's quantified this social tool. That when you make jokes at your own expense, especially because you're this successful, you're this rich, it calms people down and it relaxes them. In fact, there's a name for this effect, it's called the Prattfall effect. And there's research on this that indicates that when someone that we see as successful, powerful, accomplished, messes up a little or stumbles a little or just looks a little more human, we connect with them more. And this is something he uses a lot even outside of this interview because even on that SNL stage where he first revealed that he has Asperger's syndrome, he immediately followed with jokes that were a little bit at his own expense. I reinvented electric cars and I'm sending people to Mars in a rocket ship. <laughs> did, did, did you think I was also gonna be a chill normal dude? <laughs> and those shoulders were popping again. He didn't have that loud laugh. I think he was very nervous hosting Saturday Night Live. We could see a lot of signs of that. Now in this particular case, when he says, what does it stand for again? And he laughs, he's referencing a tweet that he wrote just a few days before this interview, where he said, what does BBC stand for again? I keep forgetting. And a lot of people online were talking about it. So in this moment, I think he's referencing that tweet and doing that same laughter. He's kind of trying to make the mood a little playful, a little light. He's referencing this tweet that a lot of people were talking about, almost kind of goofily laughing at himself in that tweet that he wrote, kind of implying that it's all in good fun. But notice what James Clayton does. As opposed to taking this light moment and kind of allowing it to get light and maybe even referencing the tweet or making some sort of light comment back, he does something he does very often throughout this interview, which is exit checking, which is he looks off to his left, where I think he's got 
you know, some producers or people that he works with, colleagues, I don't know who's there, but he's looking to them, that's his exit strategy. And then he turns back and goes, you know what it stands for. Almost like, almost like with this disciplinary thing. He does laugh a little, but it's this very forced, awkward laugh. And then he says, you know what it stands for. It's almost like Elon is trying to make it comfortable and James Klein just makes it uncomfortable once again. The reason why I think we've, you've agreed to do this is because he wanted to talk about the first six months as chief executive owner of Twitter. Um, yeah, it's kind of like whatever you want to talk about, you know? Right. So, how do you think it's gone? Well, I, it's not been boring. All right, quite a few awesome things happening there with Elon's body language. So, first off, they're still trying to establish the intention of this interview. And he says something, which is like, yeah, what, you know, whatever you want to talk about. Pretty much saying, I'm an open book. And he does a gesture that throughout this entire interview, I only saw once. Now, there's a couple of times where he rubs his hair, hand comes up. There's even one, I think, with two where he rubs his hair. But this is one where both hands come up like this for a moment behind the head like this with the two elbows popping outwards. Now this has two names in body language. They both mean the same thing. It's called either catapult or hooding. And it's the same idea. It's hands behind the head, elbows up, forming triangles. This is the definitive book of body language by Barbara and Alan Pease. It is a marvelous book to study body language. I will leave a link in the description to where you could get this delivered right to your door. It's amazing, really easy to read, but there's just, I just want to read one sentence from the paragraph on the catapult. And it's this. If we could read this person's mind, he would be saying things such as, I have all the answers or everything's under control. So, and then it goes on to give other examples of what types of things they might be thinking. But how perfect are those first two examples given exactly what he's literally saying in that moment? He's literally saying, you can ask me anything you want, I will give you all the answers. It's literally word for word what was written in this book. I thought that was just really hilarious. Uh, and also him saying, you know, everything's under control, which is kind of a theme when he's talking about Twitter. Like, I got this under control. And that's what catapult or hooding exactly means. It's usually a very confident, superior pose. Because think about it, when we do this, we're very exposed. All our organs are exposed. And typically when we're feeling stressed or defensive, we, we tend to come inwards to block those things. This is the opposite of that. Your hands are very unavailable to defend yourself. Your vital organs are all exposed. So it's a very confident pose, often seen in people who feel superior in that moment. Like they are running the show, they have the answers. And I think that's exactly what he's feeling in that moment. So then to stay consistent with that confidence, his hands go from up there down to what we call a steeple, which is when the fingers are touching like this, and he's doing it down by his knees, which is called a lowered steeple. So steepling typically is done up here, and again, it's a power pose, it's a confident pose. Now, there's a difference between this kind of thing and this. So very often we see CEOs or leaders or people in a position of power like this. And often, when they talk, they might be like this. And sometimes you'll see that lower as they listen, but it remains there. And he does it quite a lot throughout this interview, down by the knees. It's a nice, powerful display. You'll notice that it makes him seem confident, like there's nothing to hide. It doesn't look very nervous at all. It just seems like he's comfortably sitting there, and it denotes confidence. If we use the same words that the BBC uses to describe itself, right. that presumably would be okay. I'm not asking you for a yes or no, since you're not running the BBC per se, you're, there's probably, it seems to pass a, a reasonable, reasonable. So you're, so you're going to change those labels on the BBC Twitter feed and, yeah, also, yeah, and yeah, also NPLs yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, oh, right. publicly funded. Okay, now it's time for some entertainment. Keep your eyes on the deck of cards. Watch the deck of cards. Just like that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that is the best vanish I've ever seen. The second best vanish I've ever seen was Elon Musk's cell phone in that last clip. So let me tell you guys a quick story, true story. I was watching the interview and at some point I go, wait a second, Elon's not holding his phone anymore. I, but I didn't see the moment where he put it down and you know, I've been paying attention, this is what I do, but I didn't see it. So then I go back and I'm like watching it like as I'm speeding through the timeline and I go, oh, there's the point where he puts it away. And so then I took the clip and I put it with my clips that I was gonna analyze for this video and as I was going through them to write down notes, I see it again and I go, what's, what's this clip here for? 
There's no real facial expressions. The body language is pretty consistent with everything else. Why is this here? And then I realized it's the clip where he put his phone away. I missed it for a third time. And I'm willing to bet I'm not the only one. As you watch this interview, for those of you who watched the whole thing, did you ever pick up the point where he put his phone away? Or even as you watch that clip, did you notice it? It's crazy to me because as someone who observes movement, behavior, and as a magician who pays attention to small details, it seems like something I would have noticed, but I didn't. And I know exactly why I didn't pick it up. It was the most subtle thing in the world. It's not like he looked for a place and then abruptly put his phone away. It's almost like while he's carrying this conversation, almost as a secondary thing that like 10% of his brain is paying attention to, his hand drops to his side and he just jams his phone under his leg. And here's the crazy thing. It remains there for 46 minutes. His phone reemerges 46 minutes later when he looks for it and pulls it out from under his leg. Just to make sure I've actually I mean, it's maybe this is something that people on the, on the <laughs> Twitter want to say. Ask, you know, we could ask them. And that's bizarre to me because if I jam something, especially something precious like my cell phone, under my leg, I'm gonna know it's there. Like, like a small percentage of my thoughts is always gonna be aware that it's there. And when I need it, I'll know immediately where it is. But it's almost like he put it there, really close to himself, and then he kind of forgot that it was there. So in body language, there's a term called pacifiers. And pacifiers are gestures that we do that are also known as adapters or self-soothing gestures. This is any type of gesture that relaxes us in stressful situations. We can also pacify with objects. Some people pacify with a pen, some people pacify with items of clothing, with their hair, anything they might be holding in their hands. I think that to Elon Musk, his cell phone is a pacifier. I think that in the beginning he had it in his hands because it brings him comfort. You know, as someone who's really tech savvy, as someone who's very connected through his phone, and as someone who's on the autism spectrum, I feel like this is something that brings him comfort, which is why I don't think he put it too far. He didn't put it on the ground. He wanted it nearby. It literally brings him comfort, like a safety blanket. Speaking of feeling a little socially anxious and pacifiers, let's talk about the autism spectrum and behavioral analysis. One of the questions I get asked the most often in the comments is, how do you apply behavioral analysis to individuals who are on the autism spectrum when their behaviors are significantly different than neurotypical individuals. So sometimes I'll be talking about clusters of deception or stress, and I'll say something like, if all of a sudden you see someone's pacifiers start to spike and maybe their blink rate goes up or you see some eye blocking or avoidance, uh, or if you see them retreating a little bit into themselves, um, these could be signs of stress or sometimes even deception. And some people in the comments say, well, wait a second, these are all behaviors that are quite common for neurodivergent people or people on the autism spectrum, so how does that apply? So first and foremost, keep in mind that the autism spectrum is one of thousands of conditions, syndromes, or disorders that can affect someone's behavior. Anything from PTSD to social anxiety to someone who's had a stroke to someone who's a grandiose narcissist, to a sociopath. You could take the DSM and literally open to almost any page and find a disorder or a condition that affects behavior and the way someone's likely to behave, whether it's verbally or non-verbally. But luckily, there's one thing that we talk about in all our videos that's enormously important when it comes to behavioral analysis, and it helps us navigate all these possibilities. And that thing is baseline. This is why we stress baseline every time we speak pretty much about clusters of behavior. Because if someone in front of me is maintaining normal eye contact, their blink rate is normal, they're not pacifying a lot, I have no reason to believe that they have a certain condition. And then all of a sudden, if at the same time I start to see all these behaviors happen, well, it's unlikely that the person is autistic just in this moment and they weren't before, so yeah, if I'm speaking to an autistic individual and they're avoiding eye contact and there's a lot of self-soothing gestures, which we commonly see with autism, or we see some eye blocking, it won't matter each time it happens because it's the way they behave. For example, Elon Musk does avoid eye contact quite a bit. Elon Musk isn't very animated with the top half of his face. His eyebrows don't move as often as a lot of other people do. This is all part of his baseline. So when I see him avoiding eye contact, I'm not gonna pay that much attention to it. So always remember baseline, baseline, baseline. It's so important because it's gonna allow you to know the idiosyncratic gestures 
proper to that person. And these are behaviors that they're going to exhibit, whether it's in this conversation or the one after that or the one after that. This is just the way that they behave. And when you account for that, always remember we're paying a lot more attention to change, not base behaviors. I also want to give a quick shout out to all the viewers who are neurodivergent or on the autism spectrum and who comment on the videos and watch the channel because you're trying to pick up some tips on things you could see in social situations that will allow you to know what someone is experiencing socially or emotionally. I think it's so awesome that you guys are doing that because behavioral analysis takes something that's intuitive and easier for neurotypical people and kind of turns it more into data. Okay, now I'm gonna play a clip where the interviewer asks a pretty technical question about Twitter and Elon goes into a very technical answer. And I'm actually gonna play the answer on fast forward. I'm gonna speed it up because I want you to pay attention to one thing. I want you to look at James, the interviewer, and notice how many times he touches either his face or his body as Elon is answering this question. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. Okay, so here it is. I'm gonna show you the question, then the answer. Just pay attention to how many times that happens. So you don't, you don't, it doesn't keep you up at night that Twitter might go offline again? Uh, at this point, I think we've got a pretty good handle on, on what makes Twitter work. Um, and uh, we're, we're also doing it with uh, 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 two data centers instead of three. So we used to have three data centers. Right? It's a little excessive. Now, before we talk about that, let's talk about something that's happening a lot with this interviewer. He asks a question trying to make Elon uncomfortable or to like get him. And I think a part of his goal here is to get him, to catch him, to get that big story, that big headline. So he tries here by saying like, you know, are you scared that Twitter is going to crash again? And as soon as Elon is comfortable with it and actually answers the question, notice what happens with the guy. First of all, he starts nodding like this and it's almost like a dismissive nod. Like, yeah, okay, can we just move on? Like, it's almost like, okay, I didn't get you. So I don't care about this. Let's just get on to the next one. I can almost promise you at the end of that answer, if I ask the interviewer, what did Elon just say? I would bet money on the fact that he wasn't really listening. He was, I think in his head, just thinking about, okay, what's next? And we get the evidence of that because seconds after Elon starts to answer, he looks down at his phone and he does this a lot. It's like, he's looking like, okay, what's my next question here? Because I didn't get him on this one. And th this just keeps happening. And it's part of the reason I think it's very unprofessional that he has his phone in his hand. It looks very dismissive. But then there is the hand to face and the <laughs> hand to body gestures. So Elon is talking about the data centers and the algorithm and CPU usage. And this guy doesn't care about that. He just wants the drama. And he just, so what it, it's, he goes to the face, then to the belly, then to the nose, then to the face, then to the chin, then to the belly. And it's not that long an answer. Like realistically, the whole answer was just under a minute. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six times that he just touch, 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 touch. And again, this is not necessarily baseline. Is this guy touching his shirt quite often throughout this interview? Yes. Is he touching his face every now and then? Yes. But that rapid fire that many times, I honestly think it's, he wasn't prepared for this technical answer. It's not a language he could speak. It's not something that he can get Elon on. And so he's sitting there and he's, he's you know, he wants to move on from it and he's, and he's bored with it. And hand to face gestures is something we pay a, a lot of attention to in body language because there's been a lot of research that show that in stress, the blood flow of your face actually changes and this can often cause an itching sensation. So when we see these, you know, a lot of this face touching stuff and mouth blocking is something we often do when we're uncomfortable or we're trying to hold something back. So we pay a lot of attention to hand to face gestures. So we have a whole bunch of them there. And then we have him going to the belly. I think this is a pacifying gesture, uh, maybe a bit of a grooming gesture too when we fix our appearance. But these are all almost nervous ticks, and they're happening here at bam, 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 bam. And I think it's simply because, first of all, he can't keep up with this conversation. And the second reason is simply because 
this isn't where the drama is that he's looking for with this conversation. By the way, really quick note, I keep saying in this video that um, Elon Musk is the CEO of Twitter. He wrote a post and numerous times in this interview, he says quite seriously that he's not the CEO, that his dog is the CEO of Twitter. I don't know what the paperwork is on that. I don't know how official that is. So, so for the time being, I'm gonna to refer to, to Elon Musk as the CEO, but please keep in mind that there's a possibility that that is misinformation and there's a strong possibility that his dog is actually the CEO of Twitter. So then you changed your mind again and decided to buy it. Did you well, do that? Did you do that? I kind of had to. You, right. Did you do that because you thought that a court would make you do that? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the reason. Right. So you were still trying to get out of it and then you just were advised by lawyers, look, I ha you gonna we're, we're going to we're, buy this. Yes. Interesting. So you did. <laughs> so, yeah. So you, so you didn't you didn't actually want to purchase it even when you said you were going to. Well, not at that price. Oh boy, do I love this piece. So let's start with uh, James Clayton. Um, first off, when he's asking the question, he's doing a hand gesture that I think is a very rookie move for an interviewer. Um, he's asking Elon Musk a question. He's got his finger pointed like this and he's asking him like this about why he changed his mind and why he decided to buy Twitter again after he thought, you know, that after he said he wasn't going to buy it anymore. Um, I refer you back to the definitive book of body language. And in this, the authors did the research on this and they tested to see in a speaker which hand gesture creates the most connection, rapport and likability and which one creates the least. And finger pointing creates the least likability and listeners retain the least from the speaker. And there's a very good reason for this. This gesture subconsciously triggers our fight or flight response or our freeze, fight or flight or our freeze, fight or flight or fawn response. Basically, our survival instinct gets triggered because if you think about this subconsciously, what does this remind you of? You know, if we look historically, it kind of looks like there's some sort of item in my hand. It could be, I don't know, a sword, it could be a, a stick, it could be a club, it could be some kind of weapon. It, it's kind of aggressive. Also, this is the way when we discipline, when you say like a teacher or a parent disciplining their child, you might see this kind of gesture. It's not open, it's not warm, it's not inviting. And it's also not something you see very often in interviewers. I mean, look at effective interviewers who have a lot of experience, you're rarely gonna see this kind of thing. And in this moment, it did irritate me. It, it almost feels like he's, you know, accusing him of things or kind of asking this question in an unpleasant tone. And I, I highly suggest that someone like James Clayton reads up a little bit about how you can improve your body language to appear a little bit more likable because in this moment, you did not. Now, after he says yes and laughs at himself, look at James, he goes, right. And he looks at him and goes like this, like a nod of like, okay, that, that's what I wanted. And he immediately looks over to his crew or his coworkers with this kind of quick glance like, we got it, we got the answer, we got the scoop, you know? Elon Musk admits that he bought back Twitter out of fear of a court making him. So he's proud of himself in this moment. He got that dirt that he's looking for in this interview. So he kind of looks over, we see that glance, we see it twice, and he's proud of himself here. What's interesting about Elon Musk is that he, he, he's not hiding anything in this interview. He's upfront about anything, even discomfort. And it's a nice contrast to see that, that Elon Musk embraces things that he's uncomfortable with. He'll say things that upfront when he's not informed, um, he'll challenge himself and so it, there's a charm in that. James Clayton on the other hand is almost the polar opposite of that because as we look at it there's obvious stress, there's obvious discomfort but he's kind of pretending like it's not there and this is just an interview but we're seeing that slip through a lot. So there's a big contrast between discomfort that is self-aware and then discomfort that's trying to pretend like it doesn't exist. I think this is a really good point to just throw this in really quick, especially for a lot of the new viewers, where I know it seems like I'm picking a lot on James Clayton in this analysis and I'm praising Elon Musk quite a bit. And typically I try to stay very objective and look at things both positive and negative and everything that I analyze. It's just, I've studied interviewing on an academic level. I teach it, I coach it. And it's something that I really have a lot of interest in, the art of effective interviewing and this is just very ineffective interviewing. So I don't know James Klein personally. I don't know what he stands for. 
it seems in this interview that he's standing for good things that he thinks morally are important and I, and I applaud him for that. But as an interviewer, from a behavioral standpoint, there's a lot of ineffective stuff happening here and it's, it's almost to the point where I'm finding it hard to find the praise. As for Elon Musk, you might be surprised to hear this, but I neither love him as a person nor do I hate him as a person. I think he's done some amazing things that I really admire. I mean, listen, second richest person in the world. I haven't made $200 billion, so honestly, congratulations on that. Uh, but I also think he sometimes said some pretty rash things. Uh, I think he has this kind of spontaneous thing to him where sometimes he just says things. So don't hate him, don't love him, but I think he's handling this interview really, really, really well. You sacked a lot of Twitter workers. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I spoke to them, it was very easy to speak to them. Uh, when it happened and, and, and the way they said mm -hmm. pretty much everyone said is, is that it felt quite haphazard it was and it felt a little bit uncaring do you, do you, do uh, you, do I wouldn't you... say uncaring the, 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 you know the issue is like uh, the, the company's either going to go bankrupt okay so now a subject comes up that's a little touchy because Elon Musk was publicly criticized quite a bit because he fired a lot of people at Twitter he downsized a lot and the moment the subject comes up, we see quite a few things. First, both his hands go to his knees. And we've seen hand to knee, but most of the time in this interview, we're seeing that steeple, we're seeing confidence. Here, both hands go to the knees. And remember what I said earlier, this is subconsciously the, the body getting ready to leave. So we're seeing that. At that very same moment, if we look at his lips, we see a lip retraction. So this is where the lips disappear into the mouth. And it's very consistent with withheld opinion or disagreement or something we don't want to say, something we're holding back. Then he looks around and grabs his drink and takes a sip. And this is a very comforting thing to drink because first of all, it hydrates us, which helps with stress, you know, because stress raises the body temperature. So, you know, hydrating can help us deal with that. But second, it gives us something in our hands to kind of help us with pacifying or holding it in front of yourself like this to create a barrier. So we're seeing a lot of signs here of stress and it makes sense because it's a stressful topic if you have four months to live 120 days in 120 days you're dead so how so what do you want to do how much are you worth i don't know but you, i mean we're talking about around the 200 billion dollar mark i mean it's not no. quite you're framing it in in a way that that you know that it had a, had a few months to live you're quite a rich man oh <sighs> Oh my God, do I hate that. Oh my God, do I hate that. Oof, okay, J let me just start really quickly by, by <laughs> going back to the continuation of the answer. So to continue on what I was saying before, at this point, um, Elon goes to James like, you know, what would you do? You have four months, what would you do? And, and again, I think there's a continuation of that struggle. Like, yeah, I did something that wasn't great, but what other options do I have? And so he's asking this interviewer, tell me, what would you do? There's almost a part of him looking for an answer, like what other option did I have? And that answer, oh my God. I, I bet anyone who's watching this video or watch that interview who's investment savvy or business savvy or finance savvy cringed at that answer. It is such an awful answer. So Elon is going, the business is going to die. What do you do? And the guy's response is, well, how much money do you have? You're rich, you can afford to keep a failing business afloat. What? Like, how did Elon Musk get rich? How does any big entrepreneur, investor get rich? They make smart decisions and invest in things that grow. It doesn't mean that because the guy has a ton of money that he's going to keep a failing business afloat. Something had to be done. Now, I'm not saying that firing thousands of employees was definitely the right move, but I don't know what the right move is. I don't know how to keep a failing social media platform alive. But the answer definitely is not, well, you, you have a lot of money, so you could totally afford to pay a bunch of employees from a losing business that's going under. What kind of advice is that? He's saying, what would you do to save the business? Not what would you do to pay out people and lose, continue to lose money? Like, I don't even understand what he's suggesting. I, I don't, I, guys, I don't understand. Help me, I don't get it. Particularly around, um, particularly around hate speech, um, in the company. Do, is that well, what hate that you speech are you address? talking about? I mean, you use Twitter. Right. Do you see a rise in hate speech? I mean, I, I, but just a personal anecdote. Like, what do, do you? I don't. P personally, my uh, for you, I would see I get I get more of that kind of content. Yeah, personally. But I, I'm not going to talk to talk to the rest of for, for the rest of Twitter. So you see more hate speech personally. 
I would say I would see more hateful content in that. Well, you've asked me, you've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's but, why I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use. I, I, honestly, I you don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why. Because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore. Because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said you, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, well, I only look well at hang my, on a second. You said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I. Well, I, then I how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you, for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and you I, can't I, give a single I, one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no no what I claim was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or not, example. I mean, I, right? And Literally, if you, you look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, in the UK, they will say that. So you, they, look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? Then, that I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content. And then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, well, wow. COVID misinformation. Okay, uh, let me start off by saying I could probably do a two-hour video just about that interaction. There is so much going on psychologically, and it, it's literally impossible for me to cover all of it. So I'm just gonna talk about the most important things that stood out to me in this, but, but I'm sure a lot of you are, are having a, a, a freaking ball with this one. So Elon asks James, um, do you see a rise in hate speech? Just give me a personal anecdote because I don't. And that question is so brilliantly scripted. Elon Musk is setting up a situation now where he can't lose. He can either win or draw because he said, I personally have not seen a rise. Now, we're talking about the CEO of Twitter here. He's on Twitter often, he talks to a lot of Twitter users, and he's saying he personally hasn't seen that. So that's his anecdote. If James now offers an anecdote and says, yeah, I actually saw a lot of this type of comment, it's a draw because we have one personal anecdote and we have one personal anecdote. And at this point, Elon can say, well, you know, our surveys show and our statistics show, da 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 Believe me, he has all this information. But he's trying to keep it on the anecdote level. If James doesn't have an anecdote, then all we have is Elon Musk saying, I haven't noticed a rise in that, so he wins. So by saying, give me an example, because I haven't seen that, he's setting up a win or draw situation. Now, when he says, you can't even name one, we see a couple of really interesting behaviors. First, we see the arm now across the chest like this. And this is not something he's doing very often, so it caught my attention. I do see this as a blocking gesture. Because throughout this interview, he's quite comfortable. We see that steeple, we see more or less open body language. But here, we see the upper arm is close to the body, the forearm is blocking across the chest like this. He even has the fingers coming inwards, which is, these are all signs of, you know, discomfort or stress or defensiveness. So. It's not something we see very often with him, so I do think that to him, he's feeling that there's a conflict here. I don't think that he came into this conversation with a confrontation mindset. And I dare say that because he's on the autism spectrum, I don't think he picked up all the cues so far that his interviewer is trying to dig out dirt or cause some sort of conflict. Look at his head when he says, you can't even name one. So, he really emphasized that with his head, like you can't even name one and his eyes open up and it's like, it's surprising to him and he even adds a bit of a, uh, like this uh, gasp of like surprise. I see, I you can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you. He's very effectively non-verbally communicating that like, that's ridiculous. You just made this statement and you can't even name one example. As the viewer, we're seeing his expression and we're going, yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. You just said you saw a rise on your own feed and now you can't even name a single example. That doesn't make any sense. If I tell you that I went to the park and I saw a whole bunch of dogs there, obviously for me to be able to tell you that, 
my memory knows that there were dogs there. So if you ask me, okay, what's, what's one dog that you saw? I'd be able to say, oh, there was this, you know, Dalmatian, you know, black, white. I'd be able to describe that. Because that's the reason I know it's happening. So it's incongruent for him to say, yeah, I saw that on my feed, but I can't think of an example. So then how do you know you saw that on your feed? Now, so far, Elon has flipped the script here and he's actually doing a really good job. Like, on a, if we look at this as an interrogation or an interview, he's doing such a great job staying in the literal and poking holes at this guy's incongruencies. It's brilliant. The guy is trying to redirect and get out of it and say, no, you know, I said this or I meant that or yeah, I did And he's like, no, 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 you said this back it up, give me an example. And once again, because he's on the autism spectrum, things are very literal for him. So ambiguity and this kind of conversational tactics to weasel out, they don't work on him. He sticks to the literal. This is often something that autistic individuals do. They stick to very literal in the conversation. So to Elon Musk, it doesn't make any sense that a literal statement was made and it cannot be backed up by literal arguments. Then he flat out does something that I wouldn't do in an interview or an interrogation where he just goes, you, you just lied. Like he just says, you just lied. And again, it's not because he's trying to get anything out of this. It's not because he's psychologically trying to manipulate the situation. It's because he's stuck in that literal realm. He's literally going, you lied. Literally, you said something that isn't true because you can't back it up. So after Elon says, you just lied, super matter of fact, we see James get super defensive. Now he's got his arm out in front of him like this as a barrier. And he goes, no, no. He reiterates that no. No, what I claimed. You just lied. What, no, no, what I claim was. And then he says the thing that I think is his biggest downfall in this whole interview. He says, what I said was, that there are a lot of organizations who say that that kind of thing is on the rise. That is absolutely not what you said. It's the opposite of what you said. If we go back to his initial answer, his initial answer was that I'm not going to speak for the rest of Twitter, but for me personally, I've seen a rise, you know, in that kind of thing. And now he's going, no, what I said was there are a lot of organizations. P personally, my, uh, for you, I would see I get, I get more of that kind of content, yeah, personally. But I, I'm not going to talk to, talk to the rest of, for, for the rest of Twitter. Mm -hmm. No, no, what I claim was uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether, whether it has on my feed one or example. not. This is even more incongruent than not being able to back up what you said. Because he's going, you lied, you're going, no, I didn't lie, here's what I said. You literally said the opposite of that. And this is an awful look. The script has been flipped. Elon is now interviewing James and James is falling apart. Then Elon reiterates how, you know, you said that this is happening, but couldn't give me a single example. And now he actually says it, that's absurd. And as he says that's absurd, his arms are back together in the steeple position. And we see, we, we even hear a little bit of his voice shaking. And throughout this interview, you could pay attention to that. His breathing is fluctuating. There are times where with stressful topics, we're seeing more breathing up here in the chest and times where we're not. Here, we definitely see that deep breath. And we even see like a bit of like a, a, a jolt in, in the chest. Said, That's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I, but how I do think that in this moment, he's feeling that rush of this confrontation. I'm not sure he's a huge fan, but he also, can't just let this deception go by. And then what does James do? He goes, uh, uh, let's move on. We, we only have a certain amount of time. He's, he starts like really his speech goes a lot faster. He's like mumbling. He's like, oh, let's move on. We only, have, we only have a certain amount of time. You just told the second richest person in the world, one of the busiest men on earth, that well, we, we only have a certain amount of time. If anyone has a certain amount of time, it's Elon Musk. So he's trying to completely redirect here because he got caught with his pants down hard and th this interaction especially the end there that was just embarrassing uh and he goes oh, well a certain amount of time let's just move on from this we're not getting anywhere and yeah you're not getting anywhere because you tried to engage in an intellectual conversation with someone who's more informed than you who knows more about this than you who defends his position much more effectively than you and you just got called out we then believe that some of those some of that content was taken off twitter was that at the behest of the indian government I'm not aware of that particular situation. So you're, you're, just, you're not sure? I, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I don't know about that, that, you know, what exactly happened with some content situation in India. The, <clears throat> the, the rules in India for, for what 
uh, can appear on social media are quite strict. Okay, so that's an interesting first because this is one of the rare times in this interview where I felt like Elon was showing quite a bit of stress. I'll be honest with you, in an interview or an interrogation, if I saw that cluster of behaviors, it would be a red flag for me to dig a little deeper. So he's asked specifically about the Indian government as it relates to social media, and we get a lot of speech disfluency, his speech falling apart. Now this is baseline for Elon. In almost every question in the beginning, there's a bit of stammering, a bit of like, he'll say like, I think, I think, or he'll repeat things before he starts, but it's happening here a lot more than other times. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, uh, so there's pause, there's hesitation, there's what I call fluff. There's a lot of kind of stumbling on his words before he gets to an actual answer. Uh, then we see again the hands on the knees, which is quite consistent when he's feeling stressed by something. We see him clear his throat. We hear him clear his throat. Then we see the hand go through the hair. This is a grooming gesture. Anything we do to fix our appearance to appear a little bit better when we're feeling self-conscious. So all these things typically go into what we call a cluster of deception. All of a sudden these things are happening at the same time. It doesn't necessarily mean there is deception happening. I think that's a huge misconception out there. It just means it's a cluster of deceptive behaviors, which means we want to ask more questions to see why this is happening. Now, if you look at this literally, how deceptive can he be? Because he's saying, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the truth of that. So what could he be hiding? Does he have more information about that? It's possible. That's why I would want to ask more questions. But I'm going to venture a guess here. I think because Elon Musk's entire existence is based on information and being in the know, I think not knowing something makes him really uncomfortable. His intelligence is one of his biggest tools. So I think not being in the know, especially when it comes to something that relates to his business, I think that stresses him out a lot. So I think it's possible that the cluster of stress that we're seeing here, because let's be honest, cluster of deception, cluster of stress is pretty much the same thing, is related to the fact that he's uncomfortable by the fact that he doesn't know the answer to this. Let me know in the comments, what do you think? Do you feel like there's more to this? Like, we might find out more if we ask him more about this Indian government situation, or is it simply stress due to the fact that he's uncomfortable with not knowing? Okay, so there it was. Uh, I think it's pretty clear what I think about this one, uh, but I do want to clarify once again that when it comes to opinion or position, I don't agree with one more than the other. I just think that one of them defended their position much more effectively than the other one, who brought in a lot of opinions, made it personal, made it emotional, didn't have facts to back up the things he was saying. You know, as an interviewer, I would have liked to see him bring in a couple more, you know, such and such person said this, such and such expert said that. You know, he had these ambiguous, or everyone is saying this, and we spoke to some people who said that. You know, you're talking to someone who has the numbers, who has the facts, and you're showing up to a gunfight armed with a toothpick. And, and, and it became embarrassing. It became very obvious that Elon was more prepared for this conversation. But at the end of the day, when it comes to the topic, I'm not saying I agree with one, I agree with the other. I'm sure they both have strong convictions and, and they both have good points, I'm sure. But I think we saw a strong, confident, informed interviewee completely demolish an unprepared and uninformed interviewer. Look, I, I don't know James Clayton, but those of you who are from the UK, let us know in the comments is this uncharacteristic of him? Is he usually, you know, more relaxed? Is his body language usually a little bit more positive? Is he usually more, more informed? Because to me, this seemed very ineffective. And I'm wondering if it's because he's talking to the second richest person on the planet, or if he's just an inexperienced uh, interviewer. I don't really know the answer. I'm not familiar with his work. But let me know in the comments if you're a little more familiar with his work. And let me know what you thought of this video. And I will see you on the next one.